Hey, hi. Uh, can you guys hear me? Okay. So uh, let me give you a short background on where I come from. Uh, I work uh, at Intel. Uh, we work on the networking processor chips. Uh, so uh, we work on the software side of the team. Uh, I started off as a QA engineer. So of course, uh, got fed up with code just thrown over the wall to us and started automating and eventually moved into DevOps. I'm going to talk uh, a little bit. Uh, the talk is kind of like a case study on what we've done, how we've implemented it over the years, and uh, uh, what's worked for us, what are the, some of the problems that we've uh, faced, and how we've uh, kind of tackled with them. So uh, just to get started, uh, of course, uh, the mandatory legal notices and disclaimers that I need to put in. and. Uh, so this is the talk. Uh, this is what you're going to talk about uh, in detail. Uh, uh, first, uh, what we're doing right now, the introductions, uh, the background scenario. I'll just set up in a second. Uh, is the background scenario basically is that when you're dealing with hardware and you're bringing up the ASIC and the chips uh, are being designed at the same time as the software is coming up. A simulator is being written at the same time you're writing the uh, real-time software that goes with it, and as well as the te test application development is taking place. So uh, unlike having a stable platform where you could test everything and know what is happening in your code that you've just written, you have a lot more variables that are going around. Uh, and l logging sometimes works, sometimes doesn't work because your simulator itself will crash at times. So uh, we're going to talk about that. So. Uh, we're going to talk about how we set up the uh, the setting up of the system architecture problem. That is the software. Uh, you have the software. You have the simulation platform, and the test and application development taking place. Uh, we'll just cover most of these tools you've used in the past. Uh, we'll just talk about uh, uh, Git, Garrett, uh, Zool, Jenkins, and Jira. Uh, shout out to my previous to the previous speaker. They work for OpenStack. That's where we picked up Zool from. It's a great uh, pipelining tool for us. Uh, then we'll uh, talk a little bit more in detail about how we've set up the Zool and Jenkins pipelines. Uh, talk a little bit about what we uh, are looking at doing with Jira integrations, some of the issues we've faced. Uh, this is the second generation that we are doing this. So in the first generation, we went through uh, hitting a few roadblocks when we finally got the hardware in. And we still were continuing with development. So we uh, uh, plan to do uh, DevOps with hardware in the loop. Uh, and then the last uh, thing I wanted to touch on was uh, setting up the databases for somebody else in your team or uh, you yourself, uh, if you're going to branch off from DevOps, uh, to basically go and set up the problem for an AI team to consume. Uh, so just getting started, uh, some of the I mean, I'm going to rush through the first few slides. They are kind of the basic principles of DevOps and why we went into it. Uh, releases were quarterly. Code development drops were weekly over to the QA. Uh, when it came in, we had uh, dead on arrival testing that needed to be done because code just didn't even come up. Uh, and uh, you had then you did some basic uh, functionality testing. And then finally, at some point of time, the QA said, OK, we can take this piece of code that just come in, this, these reposit set of repositories, and uh, work on developing our tests and know that whatever we are doing is uh, test issue related, test development related. And eventually, QA runs a few weeks behind. So that's what. Uh, you get bulk code drops. Uh, and even when the developer sees the code, he sees bulk QA changes. He doesn't see the uh, tests as they have progressed and become larger and more expansive. Uh, yeah. Once you're moving, uh, dead on arrival was kind of a really hit back because every time uh, we got this kind of a code, it would waste a test developer's half day, one day, basically to say that, OK, this is broken. We can't use it and sit with a developer and try and figure out which in the chain of developers has actually made the issue happen. So sorry. So uh, then finally, everything leads to um, missed KPIs. One of the things uh, 
that's always important to managers is uh, even when you have new features coming up, they haven't yet been tested. None of the legacy code should be broken. And that came in as a very strong requirement because developers can go ahead and develop code. We, we can still ship the code out to our customers. Our customers are also people who are developing code on top of this uh, for the systems. So, and the next thing was peer reviews. Uh, somebody else needs to have a look at the code. So, of course, uh, the solution is DevOps. We all know that now, uh, eight, 10 years into doing it. Definitely, but what happens is when you have a single piece of software and you're trying to do it, it's uh, a fairly solved problem. Uh, a single repository, or maybe one or two repositories that are depending on each other. But when you have uh, three major teams doing uh, code development, uh, runtime software development, uh, and test and application development, system testing teams, it gets a bit more uh, into the uh, bit more difficult, as I can say. So uh, here's the example that uh, kind of the system that we we have, and which I would assume most hardware teams that are developing. Uh, anything would have is you have a simulator, and the simulator consists usually of uh, a base simulator, block simulators. Uh, I'll explain what a block simulator is in a second. Uh, but the kernel or the OS that goes on the simulator, the BIOS, the traffic generator, or your uh, exercisers, or uh, basically some kind of an external input that needs to be given to test uh, the system, the black box system. And of course, because you're running a simulator, the host OS on which you're running it also brings into account why that needs to be done. I mean, uh, any upgrades, any uh, new features of the host, host OS could also affect how it behaves, how the simulator behaves. Then uh, you have the uh, next section, which is the uh, libraries and drivers. Uh, and that's where I'll introduce blocks. Uh, what I mean by blocks is basically uh, even within uh, an ASIC chip, it's not a single team that develops all the IPs that go in there. You have a, a processor chip. You have different kinds of accelerators that go into a chip for uh, certain dedicated functions, for a security function, for a networking accelerator function, for some dedicated uh, algorithms to be run on the chip itself. So you have all of these blocks that are being developed. And each one of these blocks has their own software uh, APIs uh, and libraries that are being drivers that are developed for it. And uh, these form start forming a more and more complex problem because now you're taking, uh, taking drops from these individual teams who are not only supplying that block of software to you, but to other teams as well. So they are not uh, inclined to immediately take uh, your feedback on saying that this is broken and your priority levels could be a few weeks behind somebody else, some other team that is con consuming it. So, uh, and then of course, from the application standpoint, you have some specific tests you write for the libraries, uh, some specific tests for the simulators, and then what we call application testing is system level testing uh, tests that are being developed. So, uh, the basic uh, cycle of a code development is you develop, you test, you merge, and you keep repeating it. Uh, and of course, now uh, in a single system, you would have uh, development taking place uh, towards a test also at the same time. But here is where uh, we start working now in the system, where you have the simulator, the libraries and drivers, and uh, the test application all being written together. So what happens is uh, you get a snapshot of each one of these three major components. And that becomes into a test set. And when it works, you can classify that entire combination as a working set. And from that, you'll move forward. And uh, now, to create this working set, the individual major blocks that we have right here, I've expanded them a little bit more to say that you don't just have one block simulator, but you have different blocks, or different accelerators that are coming in. Uh, even for the libraries and drivers, uh, for the same block of chip software also, uh, of hardware, also you have multiple teams that may be delivering uh, IPs to you, 
or you might have a totally external customer who's delivering IPs to you. Uh, and you have drivers for that. So each one of these uh, blocks that you see, the sub blocks that you see, eventually becomes an individual repository that you're pulling from and changes are being pushed into. Uh, uh, same for the test application side, uh, where you have the uh, system level testing uh, and the test for simulator and APIs, but then you also have a uh, test development framework. Uh, when I, What I mean here by test development framework is how you're going to log your tests, uh, what are your go e entry and exit points going to be. Uh, most of us have some kind of a wrapper around all of our tests to say what is right or wrong, or we use something like Robo Framework or Nose Test to do the same with Python. So, uh, and then you have your automation scripts. Uh, and the automation scripts that I'm talking about are basically to run the tests itself uh, and not the DevOps framework. All of this needs to sit on top of the DevOps framework that goes ahead and is able to build uh, these blocks individually and then make them work in unison. So uh, this is what happens e eventually. You have multiple repos that need to be built together to create a simulator. Similarly, for the software, uh, any real-time software that needs to go, you have multiple repos that are going to go in. And each one of them have to be built, and that's where you have your test set available to you to go ahead and run it. So in a more simplistic case, once you have built one of these three things, you have a test sta state available, uh, stable set the same as a working set that I just described. You, you know uh, this set of changes are actually working for you. At this point of time, uh, if you needed any one of these, uh, to take changes into any one of these uh, three blocks, what you would do is you would take the last table changes from the other two blocks, the last builds from the other two blocks, and go ahead and uh, run it to get uh, the next. And when the run is complete, if the test set passes, you can promote the uh, those builds as a stable set and then move from there forward. So that basically sets up the problem as what you would do if this, these were just three individual repos. But we'll get into uh, how you can handle dependencies and uh, how each one of these can be used. Uh, so just an overview of the tools that uh, we use uh, is uh, Git uh, for source code repository control. Get it basically uh, to handle uh, uh, code review and verification management. You have Zool over there that basically pipelines the code for us, helps with integration and testing from these multiple repos. Uh, Jenkins also has some of the features that Zool does. Uh, it allows me to take triggers from uh, Gerrit events and go ahead and uh, run uh, the jobs itself. But here we're using Zool as the triggering event and actually using Jenkins uh, with the pipelines and the job runners uh, to execute all of our jobs. And then we have our uh, issue tracking tools like Jira. So most of the ones that we use, the top four are actually, we use the open source versions. Uh, of course, Git, we have our own secure Git. So uh, this is what traditionally happens with source code control is you have code developed, verification, uh, maybe somebody might do it before they actually end up committing the code. It always doesn't happen uh, because of time constraints more than anything else. That's what I've learned over the years is. And then you use it with Garrett, where you've now introduced the uh, concept of having to wait for a peer-driven code review, as well as a verification vote that needs to come in for, uh, for any change to be committed. So before this time, it basically, Garrett kind of holds it. Uh, if you're not familiar with it, it holds it in something like what you can call an escrow. Uh, the code is there. It's available for anybody to pull down, use. But uh, it's available for you in the repository to go build out the rest, uh, um, create all your builds, and go test it. But it is not yet merged into the system. So now that you have uh, something in place where you can go vote and keep, a, uh, keep the changes in holding, which are out of the developer's workspace, but 
uh, still uh, in holding, you need to go ahead and automate that uh, space. This is just talking about, uh, I get it a little bit more in detail where you have manual code reviews or you could have automated code reviews. Uh, and what I mean by that is if your code review is coming from something like a, s a static analysis that you're doing on your code, uh, they can also go ahead and give you some votes in code review. Uh, similarly, you have your verification votes. Uh, they should, uh, and we've implemented it as a rule, is uh, verification vote can only come from the DevOps uh, uh, interface. Uh, you shouldn't be, nobody should be allowed to, unless really required uh, explicitly give the DevOps vote out, uh, the verification vote out. And whenever the verification vote is there and the code review votes are there, nobody actually goes ahead and submits the code. It happens automatically. So in a way, what we've done is we've taken the privileges out of a developer's hand to actually be able to push any code into the system. Uh, so. Uh, that's the entire problem that we, I was talking about. You have the uh, three sets available uh, of data available to uh, builds available to you. You need to take them through verification and voting and uh, a code review voting, and then you need to basically test it uh, with the last table set, the changes with the last table set for the other two. So, uh, how does our code flow? Uh, very simply, it goes uh, from the developer's environment into the Garrett uh, environment uh, where it's in holding. And as soon as an event takes place in Garrett, it basically uh, has triggers that come off of it. Uh, Zool is an engine that we uh, are using, a uh, pipelining tool that monitors all of these events. Uh, if you're uh, familiar with uh, Jenkins uh, monitoring Garrett events, uh, it kind of does it in the same way. Uh, I'll talk about it a little bit more. Uh, from the Zool uh, events, all is it's doing is actually pipelining all of the tools. What it goes ahead and it, it does is it uh, triggers off all our uh, the, the build and check jobs, uh, build and test jobs in Jenkins. Uh, when that is done, uh, you have a vote come back from Jenkins that says whether uh, to whether the test has passed or not, whether the code is good or not. And that goes ahead and allows Garrett to move the uh, code forward, move the votes forward. So uh, the two pipelines that I'm talking about that Zool does in uh, basic, what we have is we have two pipelines, the check and the gate. So let me talk about the check and the gate pipeline and I'll go back to the previous one. So what happens is uh, the check pipeline is basically something that we need to run as soon as a developer uh, submits any code uh, in the system. There are, there are a bunch of quick tests that are running. Uh, maybe it's just the build uh, of the individual repo itself or of the entire simulator uh, or library stack that you have. It depends on what you want. At that point of time, uh, you may have some initial tests that you want to run in the check pipeline. This usually happens before a peer even gets to review the code because it happens immediately as soon as it's pushed up. Uh, peer review takes a little bit of time. You get an email. Somebody goes ahead and checks the code and gives it a review. So it becomes easier that nobody has to go and keep reviewing the code if the code has any issues already that are being com that have come out of the uh, verification itself. So once that happens, uh, the code moves on. Uh, if everything passes, it moves on into the gate. And the gate has more extensive tests. The gate test will run just before it commits. So if the gate fails, it will go back into the check pipeline. But if the gate passes, it will get committed immediately. So uh, as you can see, when you're running your check pipeline, uh, it's still going to be in holding even after that. So you can run all of your test code in parallel. Whereas in the gate, on the gate side, you're running all your code sequentially because you want to run it on top of the uh, latest changes in the repo, as well as the la latest set of changes in the entire set of repos that you have. So that's uh, a more detailed view of what I just explained. Uh, so you have your initial repo. It, uh, a developer clones it. Whenever he's ready to check in the code, he goes ahead and he points it out to get it. 
uh, once it's available in Garrett, uh, the Garrett trigger goes ahead and launches off the Zool check pipeline over there. Uh, this is where it even takes care of some of the dependent changes that are going to go in. Uh, if there are two rep repos which are interdependent, uh, then it basically clones down both the repos and creates a build uh, and a build set which has changes from both the repos available to it. So in this multi-repo environment, it becomes more useful. Uh, I'll come back to that in a second. Uh, if that passes, it goes ahead, and uh, if the Jenkins job passes, it goes ahead and it goes back and it tells Zool that everything is passed. Zool is the one who's actually going ahead and voting in Garrett for you to use. Uh, when that happens, uh, if it fails, it'll, it'll give it a negative vote and it'll go back into Garrett, just a holding area where the code developers can go and uh, resubmit a new patch set. If it passes, it goes ahead whenever a code review is available uh, from multiple users or single users. Uh, it goes into the gate pipeline. And if the gate test passes, it will go ahead and commit it immediately into your uh, main repository or main repositories if it's a dependent change. So Zool helps you do a few things uh, in the dependency module, but doesn't cover everything. Um, so this is uh, something that I got off uh, a great tutorial that I have down there uh, about working with Zool. Uh, I know that's not viewable on the screen uh, correctly, uh, but if you even start off with that, you'll get it in the RDO project uh, if you uh, Google Zool. What it basically represents uh, uh, in just a gist is you have two repos available. You have the Zool gating system. Uh, what Zool basically does is makes a clone of, the, of your repo from Garrett, and it merges the changes required. So if you have changes in multiple repositories, repo A and repo B, that, are, that need to be tested out together, it will create uh, holding, uh, repositories for both of them, merge the code into them, and uh, have it available for you to pass on to your jobs to actually execute, to build and execute the code. Uh, so at this, uh, uh, at the same time, uh, it talks about Apache. That's just a Zool status page that you can look at in the interim. Uh, let me sh show you one more thing. And this is I wanted to actually show what a Zool status page looks like. Uh, so you have your check gate and post pipelines. Uh, I haven't described post pipelines. I can zoom it out if this makes more sense. Uh, this is not ours. This is the OpenStack. Uh, Zool is an OpenStack software, so this is this is a picture out of their their implementation. So when you have multiple changes going in and multiple uh, developers putting in code uh, behind one other, or you are having a single developer. In this case, what you can see is like a single developer has put in two co two pieces of uh, two commits in on the leftmost stack, and then the next one is a few more commits. And but on the gate side, you see that everything goes in a sequential line. So all commits are put behind uh, the previous commit available in the gate pipeline that got uh, each commit that is available that got pipelined now. So you have a nice stack and code is always tested uh, on top from the top of all the stacks. Uh, so uh, all of these uh, individually, uh, what you see, uh, they have multiple uh, jobs running within them, Jenkins jobs that are triggered on each one of these blocks. So going back to the slides, uh, So what we said now was uh, what happens uh, in Zool. And one of the issues that comes up whenever you're dealing with multiple repositories is basically a depends on functionality. So you have uh, something in the simulator that I just described that is dependent on something in the driver to come up. Or it usually it's the other way around. If a driver needs to be loaded, there needs to be something to load the driver on in the simulator side. 
so you have a dependency that comes up over there and uh, so what you even though the driver code is available through specs uh, the the developer has written the driver code he doesn't need to hold keep it in holding or that team doesn't need to keep it in holding they can just submit it to get it put it depends on uh, into the commit message that it depends on uh, another ID in get it which can be a holding ID and what Zool will make sure is it does not uh, whenever it goes and it triggers all the tests it will make sure it has pulled down uh, everything from the dependent commit and before that set of tests passes it won't allow uh, this commit to go through so that helps us work with one-way dependencies uh, directly where one is w uh, dependent on the other some of the other things that we've seen is cyclic dependencies, which we've handled through custom scripts, uh, uh, since uh, it's uh, kind of difficult and you have one-off cases that we've had with b the BIOS changing or the kernel changing, and which is dependent on multiple changes. So there are some things that uh, occur uh, every few weeks. Uh, so some of them we've written custom automation scripts for it, some of them till date we do need to handle it manually too because you don't know when you have so many parameters which one's going to change so and that's just uh, describing a little bit more on uh, how the depends on works uh, in detail but uh, the next part I want to talk, talk about a little bit was uh, Jira integrations uh, we usually uh, use some kind of a bug tracking tool a feature tracking tool um, Jira or Bugzilla uh, or whichever one uh, you all use in your uh, company. What you can do is basically use DevOps, and what we would, what we are doing is using uh, some of these things, uh, using DevOps as a driving force for some of these things, like automated bug creations, automated test test tag creations. As to when a test fails and you've just created a bug with it, the tests that have failed need to go and get tagged in with the Jira so that whenever the Jira needs to be marked as wor completed again, closed again, it is only uh, done via the DevOps uh, flow. So that it can go ahead, it can pull the right set of tests uh, and run it. Because the Jira might be created in post commit tests. You have a huge number of regression tests that you run post commit and those are the ones that are running the Jira. So you have that and the bug and feature set movements that I just described. Of course, what are the some of the issues we faced? Uh, this is a good one. I'll just talk about a few, uh, couple of these uh, in detail. Uh, one of them is memory leaks. Uh, one of the biggest things that we face uh, when we are working with simulator especially is memory leaks and how do we track it and where it happens. Uh, in a lot of cases, Things are going to be blamed on you as a, uh, as a on the DevOps team because they think that the whole system just crashed and that's why things didn't work, or your resources crashed and that's why things didn't work. But uh, because some of these leaks takes place uh, on an intermittent basis, some of these issues only surface on an intermittent basis. So what you basically need to be is cognizant of the fact that this can happen. Uh, you should have some kind of uh, uh, hooks in place in your automation scripts to uh, log some of the data underneath that when this is happening. Uh, we've not been able to still do it completely uh, automated, but we do have some kind of triggers that we go ahead and we see uh, what's happening uh, during uh, this kind of an intermittent failure uh, that picks takes up and that basically leads you to the next point that is the identification of the point of failure when you have these multiple systems running at the same time otherwise it's uh, a ball that is just being passed around uh, as to who needs to look at the issue in detail uh, it does require a, a little bit of effort on the whole mindset process of people because it makes it more uh, essential for the developers to have a look into the QA code uh, and the QA and the test uh, developers to basically have 
more visibility into the developer's code. So mindset is one of the other things that I've we faced as a important pro problem to get through. Uh, in preparation for hardware in the loop, uh, I'll just describe it uh, from uh, the diagram uh, since I'm running out of time. But uh, some of the things that you need to do beforehand is uh, look at how you're going to make your preparations when your hardware finally arrives and the simulator is suddenly just going to be replaced uh, all the tests want to be replaced so some of the things that you could have in place that make a lot of sense is uh, board reservation system especially if your board uh, resources are going to be shared between humans and uh, the devops uh, machinery uh, at the same time you have your board bring ups that need to be uh, done in detail uh, getting your automated scripts ready for uh, having the BIOS come up, for the kernel uh, boot to come up. And uh, oh, what's, uh, what's important in that is when that happens, uh, sorry, I lost my train of thought. Uh, uh, another thing that you need to look at is what kind of traffic generators that uh, are you using? So. Uh, one of the things that we found useful to do is actually create an abstract layer right when we are in the simulator world as to how the traffic goes to the test so that when we move into the hardware platform, all we are changing is what's beneath that abstract layer uh, for the input systems uh, so that you have whatever traffic is available from the simulator traffic into a hardware traffic like Ixia. And lastly, what I wanted to talk about was you have these this huge amount of data in terms of the code changes that are taking place, in terms of the tests uh, that are running with these code changes, and the logs for each one of these tests. And what you, what you have is basically the data that you need to uh, apply machine learning to in this uh, phase. So one of the th some of the things that you could do to uh, kind of help uh, create the correct data set is go ahead and have the correct uh, inputs to the Jenkins and Jira. Uh, so that, because nobody's going to go back and uh, look at the code and uh, say why an issue took place. So if you have the correct checkboxes and uh, logs, then that works very well. And of course, uh, that's just a quick uh, review of what are the kind of fields that you can have, causes, resolutions. Uh, just one point over here, your, your data set doesn't need to be full. It can have question marks or not applicables in there, and that's perfectly fine. That can be taken care of uh, in the ma machine learning algorithms. Uh, and yeah, that's kind of it what I had uh, for the talk today. Any quick questions? Or I've run out of time, so I'm just going to be on the side if anybody has any other questions. Thank you.